Jeff done his PhD from Imperial College, and then he worked a long time in Alcan as a principal scientist, and his main expertise is uh, surface science. Uh, and then the later on, the last 15 years, he's working in the recycling mainly. The initially, the 20 years before he, he made the industry to think about recycling, and then he generated lots of funding and demonstrate the benefit of recycling. So over to you, Jeff. <laughs> OK, thanks, Hiran. And uh, thanks you for inviting me to give this colloquium. Uh, this aluminium from cans to cars talk I've been running, I guess now, since about 2005, I think it was in its first guise, but uh, it gets renewed every time. And uh, since I haven't given it for a, a couple of months, uh, most of the slides or a lot of the slides that are in this this version are, are actually new. So, so this is a great opportunity to, uh, to test run some new slides. So I'm just trying to change the slide. Hmm. Which isn't happening. Oh, it is great. OK, well, I'll be amusing on the, uh, the colour of aluminium um, because I, I heard a talk a few weeks ago on the colour of hydrogen. I was quite impressed that they were talking about uh, blue hydrogen and black hydrogen and green hydrogen. And I thought, ah, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if we could start giving aluminium different colours. So I immediately thought, my thoughts came to the point that I thought that where aluminium is being made primarily with uh, coal-fired electricity, that's definitely black aluminium. And then we have many, many shades of, of, of grey aluminium as we move from coal-fired electricity through to uh, oil-fired electricity to gas-fired electricity to hydropower. So it becomes it becomes greyer and greyer. And then I read something about celestial aluminium made using solar generated uh, electricity in, in the Gulf. And so that obviously becomes yellow aluminium. And then so, but I don't think any of that really gets to the point where it's fully green yet, because it's still quite carbon intensive, particularly if you look at all the carbon intensity of all the all the stuff that happens before you get to the smelting operation, which is more difficult to make green. So I, I ended up just obviously from my point of view, I like calling uh, aluminium from end of life scrap, the green aluminium, because I think that has the potential to be the lowest carbon form of the metal and it has the potential to be zero carbon if we can decarbonize the, uh, the, the melting procedure by using uh, hydrogen fired furnaces, green hydrogen fired furnaces rather than, than gas fired furnaces. So that's that's just a bit of musing to get us going. Uh, and this is just, I, I pinched one of European aluminium's graphics and just change the colouring so that you, know, you can see how it, I think it looks nicer now. You can go from the black through the greys down to the green, which I'm reserving for the uh, for the end of life recycled aluminium scrap because I think that 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 at the moment is by far the, the lowest carbon form of the metal. And that in various projects, I keep being asked, particularly the APC type projects, they always seem to want to have a what's called a CO2 walk to start any meeting. So I've been been thinking about that uh, quite hard. But recently, the IAI uh, at the end of March produced a really excellent, so the International Aluminium Institute produced a really excellent sustainability report that I've mined deeply for this talk. And th this just really summarizes in just a few bullet points exactly what's required for the aluminium industry to, to decarbonize in order to be in, in line with the uh, requirements that it uh, it should dramatically reduce its CO2 emissions by by 2050. And it, that what they're really saying is that that the total emissions from the aluminium sector has to be reduced to about 250 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent from a baseline now of over, over um, 1,100 metric tonnes of CO2. And because if things don't change, that, that, that's going to get up to a lot more by 2050, a business as usual level of 1.6 thousand, 
1.600 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And this, this, this is really saying that in order to get there, in order to prevent uh, aluminium's contribution to global warming getting out of hand, that uh, all the electricity consumed in all these processes, particularly the smelting process, has to come down to, to this very low level. Also that it's very important that all the other emissions, the non-electricity based emissions are also dramatically released, reduced. And also, if we are going to really maximise the use of recycling as we need to from end of life, and also to maximise the, the carbon intensity of all our fabrication processes and procedures, they also have to be reduced significantly. So there's a, there's a tremendous requirement for the aluminium industry to actually make a, a huge difference to its, its uh, carbon intensity over, over, the, over the next 20 years. And you can see what the real problem is with this sort of heat map, which again comes from, 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 the, from the same report, which just shows just how much of the intensity, the carbon intensity is, is, is due to the electrolysis going on during, during the primary production process. You can see that it's contributing of the 1.1 billion tonnes of, of CO2 produced by the aluminium industry. You can see just how much of that is produced during the electrolysis stage, which is why there's so much attention on this. But I think, you know, what we should really be doing is trying to minimise the use of primary aluminium as, as best we can, and also to, to maximise the use of, of recycled aluminium. This is just a very nice way of of expressing the problem of really focusing on the thing that is the most important to do. The uh, International Energy, uh, I, the IAE or IEA or something, IEA, that's the one, have really suggested that the aluminium industry really needs to reduce the, the carbon footprint of primary aluminium from its present average level of around 16 tonnes per tonne of aluminium primary reduced around to two tonnes per tonne. So they're not really saying that aluminium has to get, primary aluminium has to get to zero. And the aluminium industry is being allowed this uh, because aluminium is seen as a, as a vital material for lots of the other uh, carbon reduction exercises in lots of the other industries, particularly the transport industry. So it's not really being charged with getting down to, to, to zero tonnes per tonne in the primary process, but getting down to, to two tonnes per tonne in order that we, we can not exceed the beyond two degrees temperature rise scenario by 2050. So this is, this is a really nice, nice graphic that shows what really needs, what the industry really needs to do. Uh, hydro aluminium uh, has, I think, are probably one of the leading companies in actually looking at the generation of clean aluminium from the, from the primary process. And, and they're not so obsessed as most of the others, like Rossal and Rio Tinto, with uh, non-carbon use of non-carbon anodes, use of dim dimensionally stable anodes, so you're not consuming carbon in the process. But that, that's 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 been going on for years and years, and I'm not really convinced that either Rossal or or Elisis actually has anything that that wasn't around 20 or 30 years ago. But it's going to be interesting to see if any of those processes ever get to the point of being properly commercialised. They're way, way, way off that step at the moment. But it's, it's interesting to read their publicity about it because they're obviously they're putting in, they're putting a lot of interest and a lot of publicity. And it's possibly it's either very valid or some of the best greenwashing you'll ever hear. The um, the hydro approach is really is, 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 is to progressively look at everything in, in the aluminium primary production chain that, that can be changed and can be improved. So they're looking at all areas from the bauxite through to alumina, through the anode production, through to all the power generation, smelting, casting, etc. to see what can be done. And But even they're saying that to get from their most uh, low carbon primary aluminium made lovingly with hydro electricity generated uh, electricity from hydro generation, uh, which gets down to about four tonnes per tonne, that pushing down to two tonnes per tonne is going to take require another huge step. And I was quite interesting when I first read that, I didn't really understand, I should have understood immediately what, what they were doing with, with that little box which says PCS on the on the far right of the of the right hand image. That, 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 and that, that 
I, I didn't then realize that they're they're talking about putting post consumer scrap into into the into the prime operation. That's the first time I've heard of that. I'm, I imagine it's a good idea if it's scrap that you can't recycle any other way. But I don't know any details about that yet. But it just shows how difficult it's going to be to reach the two tons per ton target, even with all the uh, dimensionally stable anode work and possible carbon capture. Of course, this is going to cost a the industry a huge amount of money. And the the estimates in, in the IAI uh, report suggests that it's, this is going to be of the order of, of trillions of dollars because the demand for aluminium is going to go up. So not only is there a replacement of existing smelting capacity, which should be discontinued because it's either too old or it's it's carb is based on the use of coal. So there's there's uh, retiring of smelting capacity is also generation of new smelting capacity. So there's a lot of new smelting capacity. There's a lot of new alumina requirement re capacity required, and there's lots of investment in either the, the dimensionally stable anode technology or the carbon capture and underground storage technologies, uh, which are really, really a tiny fraction of production at the moment. And then, of course, there's not just um, proper uh, electrification of the smelting, it's electrification of all the other operations, moving away from gas wherever possible, and, and also uh, 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 in, in that, and that's both for the primary and the, re, and the renewable sectors. And it's, it's really vital because, as I said a minute or two ago, that it's, uh, it's really important not just for the aluminium industry, it's also important for lots of other industries that are, particularly the transport industry, that are looking to reduce their, 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 their carbon, embedded carbon or their CO2 emissions, etc. So it's going to cost it trillions. I imagine there's another figure for, for the steel industry, which is also trillions. It'd be interesting at some stage to compare trillions, but I haven't got I haven't got the steel data in front of me. Uh, what's been going wrong in the world of aluminium is that more and more of the of the smelting that's been going on of aluminium has been based on the use of coal rather than the use of hydropower. You can see in the in in, in over the history how that how the mix has changed. And if you look in more detail, that's almost entirely due to what's been going on in China. And as China has become the, the dominant supplier of primary aluminium worldwide, the carbon intensity of that aluminium supply has gone up and up. But this is this is just really just the, the final part from the IAI su survey is that or report is is that this is this really shows what's absolutely critical. It shows the, the present situation or the 2018 situation with 64 million tons of primary produced, 13 million tons of prompt scrap going in to the mix and 19 million tons of end of life scrap going into the mix. If, if things just run riot and uh, nothing is done, that the, the primary will move to 88 million tons per year. Uh, there'll be more uh, prompt scrap put in and there will be an quite a large increase in end of life scrap, but it shows a balance of 2018 of 59 million tons of, of, of end of life scrap. But if we actually do what's, what's required to actually get to the better possibilities of, of, of a lower carbon uh, aluminium industry, you can see it's looking at not such a huge increase in primary aluminium, perhaps just to 74 million tons. Is looking for the same amount of prompt scrap recycling, but it's looking for a really big increase in end in end of life recycling of old scrap, and that's that's the thing that really interests me. I have to show this slide because uh, it's 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 um, any Bcast talk has to has to show this slide, but it's it, it's just been it's been a, I think the only comment and it's been a, it's been around a long time, but it catches um, what we're really up to very very well that uh, it's. There are various stages of, 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 of doing things well in the industry and in all applications. One of the best ones is reduced usage by using the, your materials most efficiently and obviously then reduce remanufacture, recycling, recovery, go through go through less slightly less favored routes. And it really all all this is trying to make sure is that we absolutely minimize the what we're, we're doing at, at the mining level. Of course, none of these things are particularly new. I always I like to show this slide, which shows 
Glenn, T. Se Glenn Theodore Seaborg's vision from 1978, which I think where he captured what I think is really, really important in the world of materials or the world of metals in particular, in a few simple words that he said that, you know, we've really got to change the way we look at primary and secondary materials. We have to consider the, the secondary materials as, a, as, a, as our primary resource and our primary materials as only for top up for losses and for in, increased consumption in any particular application. So I think that, that captured it really nicely. Aluminium, the magic metal. So moving on to where the biggest problems are, just looking at a European point of view that uh, that the biggest uh, carbon dioxide problem comes from transport in Europe and the biggest part of that problem is what's coming out of the car fleet. So we really need to be worrying about how we tackle the emissions coming from cars. And because the easiest way is to just to take the weight out of the car because emissions are directly re related to the, the weight of the thing you're trying to drive around, whether you're doing it with petrol, diesel or petrol hybrid or even with electric propulsion. So you can see that the, uh, the CO2 emitted in grams per kilometre of travel is really directly related to the curb weight of, of, of the vehicle you're driving. And if you can actually make vehicles that, that only weigh around half a tonne, you can get very, very low CO2 emitted per kilometre. It's the gift that keeps giving as you keep taking more and more weight out of the vehicle. What it really shows is that uh, in, uh, at this time, diesel look, looks better than petrol, which it still does, and petrol hybrids are really just about the same as diesel. So you start to think, what's the point of hybrids? And if you look at this, which I actually captured, I think, last week from uh, the Transport and Environment website, it shows that, that hybrids are possibly the next big uh, emissions scandal to hit the automotive industry, if, uh, if, if this can be truly believed because it just really shows that that as usual with uh, with car CO2 emission figures there's a huge discrepancy between the official rating and the real world rating it's usually around about 40 percent the difference and what this really shows is if you actually drive your your company uh, PHEV uh, on motorways most of the time the uh, emissions are really quite dreadful hopefully no one's driving one of these Fortunately, I can't see the audience. I can't see if anyone's looking particularly red faced at the moment. So, yes, we'd like to take the weight out of cars, but cars are actually increasing in weight. Mostly, and that's really because we don't like uh, killing so many people in cars these days, and it's mostly safety features that's, that have actually meant that the the progressive a rate of increase of weight of the vehicle keeps going up, plus, of course, the fact we always want more and more features on our cars. So it doesn't really matter who the uh, manufacturer is. You can see that they're all suffering from, from, from weight increase as a function of time. And it's, it almost seems to be remorseless. And that really is absolutely the, th the thing we don't want to happen. Nicely, uh, we're starting to see a big increase in EV sales hopefully mostly of pure BEVs rather than various forms of dreadful hybrid. But well, while the tax regimes are as they are, it's probably not happening quite as well as it should. Uh, even with uh, electric vehicles, we really want to drop the weight of vehicles driven by batteries because it, it really, it, if you can take the weight down, you can get much better range on the same weight of battery. Or if you're happy with the range, you can, you, 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 if you, if you take the uh, the uh, the weight of the the vehicle down, you you can you can drop the weight of the battery. And of course, that that means money. This is that's quite an old graphic that I put together a few years ago, uh, which needs to be changed to really take into account the, the fact that uh, battery pack prices are dropping dramatically with time. Which I mean, almost at the point where the manufacture and selling price of an electric vehicle will be very cost competitive with an internal combustion engine vehicle very soon. The thing that's driving the OEMs to uh, to make the change to electric vehicles isn't really because they really want to do it, it's because they have to do it to stay in business. And you can see that the 
legislated requirements to actually achieve a certain uh, CO2 efficiency per kilometre driven uh, is really starting to bite. And you can see uh, again from just just from from the web, just looking at looking for what uh, what sort of fines a, a company is paying uh, and like have been paying and are likely to pay in 2021 and 2022. You can see it's really starting to hit home for not meeting the legislated requirements. And you can see various different card companies and and how much money they're having to hand back or have to pay as fines for not achieving COT. CO2 targets and you can see this is it's a huge incentive to bring out more and more uh, hybrid and, and, and electric vehicles. So where is aluminium sitting in all this? I've been obsessed with aluminium intensive vehicles since I was first brought into talking to British Leyland on the Gaydon site in about 1981-1982 time when British Leyland first came to uh, Alcan as it was then and said they'd quite like to make a few metros out of aluminium rather than steel. So all that happened there is that I think they made six metros using the same tooling and the same production lines as we use for the steel metro. And, and we made six vehicles, demonstrated that the body weight was 40% reduced and that the and, and and that the performance of the vehicle was dramatically increased. At that time we were just talking about the main structure. We in fact we thought we'd either hang on steel panels or or plastic panels. Uh, British Leyland disappeared, disintegrated, the project stalled and we did it again with with Fiat and we made five little uh, Batoni Fiats which showed the same thing as we did with the Metro that you could very easily make the uh, the, the, the pressings on on pretty well on, on on the same production line and that you could save up to 40 percent weight in the body structure. Then we did it again with Ford in North America. This time we, we built 40 of the uh, aluminium AIVs. Uh, this time we, as well as using a 5000 series for the body structure, we were using 6000 series outer panels. And, and again, uh, a, um, the structure was not redesigned because it was aluminium. It, it was just it was still the steel um, design vehicle, but just rebuilt in using aluminium panels and parts. So that was 10 years. We went from six a year to 40 a year. Uh, in 2003, Jaguar Land Rover really took up the aluminium intensive vehicle story and we eventually produced the first series of XJs at a build rate of about 30,000 a year. It's using essentially the same technology that was in, in the Metro, but with clearly now with the 6,000 series external panels. We hadn't convinced uh, JLR that uh, spot welding was, it, was effective enough for aluminium compared to steel. So there was a lot of use of both adhesive bonding and rivets. So each Jaguar XJ comes with more than 3000 complementary steel rivets to hold it together. This technology was then transferred from Jaguar into Range Rover. Once particularly we'd, we'd uh, sorted out some things on the prompt scrap recycling. So I'll talk about it later. And that the production volume by 2012 got up to 100,000 vehicles a year. So starting to, starting to move along quite nicely, but in, in world uh, production terms, still very, very modest. The next one uh, I put in this, in this, in this slide because it, it, it's showing laughably, or perhaps not quite so laughably, it, it was meant to be showing that the technology could be moved down to more affordable vehicles. But I, I still never don't consider the Jaguar XE uh, to be really to be an affordable vehicle to, to most people's pockets, but at least it was moving from the executive type class down to the D class vehicles. And in this this was the first time that um, a so-called recycled 5754 was used in in the in the body construction. Although that recycled 5754 only used prompt scrap. Then the most interesting thing was really through the Jaguar link to Ford at the time. Ford then decided to make their F-150 truck a body out of out of aluminium rather than steel. And that's quite interesting because they're now making that at around a million uh, examples each year, which is which is really staggering. I think when I put this together, it was about 100,000 a year, but now I think it's closer to a million a year, 
and the amount of money that Ford are making from this vehicle is pretty well as the as the, as the same as the economic value of, of a small country. So it's quite it's quite impressive. So in two in two slides we go from six per year up to a million a year, showing that the technology is quite robust. But obviously a million vehicles out of the uh, 90 million made every year, I think it's about right, um, it's, it's still a long way to go. Uh, then after the uh, the Ford F-150, the, the, in, the next interesting vehicle is probably the Jaguar I-Pace, which uh, although it's, it's um, produced by Jaguar, it's not produced in the UK, it's produced in, in the Czech Republic or Slovenia, I can't remember quite which one, but uh, it, it's, it's still using it essentially the same uh, way of, 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 of mass producing an, an aluminium intensive vehicle. Uh, this was probably the last vehicle that Mark White at Jaguar Land Rover was uh, responsible for designing and pushing the aluminium initiative. And since he's left JLR, the enthusiasm and interest in aluminium has dropped considerably. But it just shows you that uh, that the aluminium body structure is, is quite a nice um, complementary use of mainly sheet, but with some castings at nodal points, extrusions, uh, and, and still a, a few steel stampings, but it's, it's predominantly still an, an aluminium structure. And they're very proud at, at, at how light, how strong and how lightweight this, this body structure is. The Tesla story is, is probably the latest story, and this should be the, the one where the aluminium intensive vehicle goes from mass produced, um, mass produced or mass producible internal combustion fuel vehicles and modestly, modest numbers of electric vehicles to a mass market electric vehicle as exemplified by the Model 3 or the Model Y. But you can see what happened that Tesla were very keen on aluminium intensive structures through the Model S and, and the Model X. But then when they got to the Model 3, they were, I think, Arcelor Mittal camped on top of them uh, and offered them as, as much money as they wanted to switch to steel, which they did. So that that really spoiled that aluminium intensive vehicle initiative. And that so aluminium in the in, in the Tesla Model 3 and the and the Model Y is still there, but it's it, it's quite limited as to, to what parts of the uh, of, of the structure it's now used for. And there's some really interesting stuff happening at Tesla in terms of use of aluminium vehicles. It's really going back to uh, the dark ages when aluminium vehicles was first thought of by companies like Ford and Pierce Arrow when they actually decided to cast huge bits of cars. I, to me, it's, it seems a very retrograde step because the idea is that you you, you get efficiency of manufacture and you get uh, integration of parts in a huge way. So, for example, I think in in the illustration it says that from the from the Model Three with a with a, essentially a multi component underbody rear underbody with 70 pieces, uh, the uh, the Model Y underbody, which is this huge casting, or in fact two huge castings at the moment. Uh, it's just down to, to two parts. So there's huge part integration, but it actually weighs more than the than the part it's replacing, which I, I never think is a good idea. But just to give you an illustration of what's required to do a high pressure die casting of, of this size, you can see uh, what looks like a, a, a scale model of, of the machine. And then you can see the actual machine at Tesla and you can see the man standing behind it, beside it, to give you an idea of just how big it is. I'm not sure this is the right way to go, but uh, the interesting thing that, uh, that Elon Musk is, is doing is he's, he's actually taking his prompt scrap from the press shop, which will get about 50 percent, and he's, he's moving it directly and, it, and it's going directly into the casting alloy. It, we, we just, so it's being, it's, the, the casting alloy, alloy is a blend of, um, of press shop scrap, uh, which is modified to add silicon to give you a, a fairly standard sort of A356 type casting alloy, but that's what it's being done. I think that he'd be much better 
using his prompt scrap back into Rort and looking for somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else, some other scrap streams, amended life scrap stream for his casting alloys. Um, why are we so obsessed with making the alloys, whether it's a, a casting alloy and extrusion or, or a sheet alloy in particular from scrap? Uh, this, this is really uh, captured in, in this graphic, which shows the green line, which is the price the, uh, that aluminium costs to buy per tonne on the London Metal Exchange. And you can see how the price bounces up and down, but you can probably draw a line through it at around 13 to $1,400 a tonne, and, and that will give you a, the rough price of, of, of a tonne of aluminium over that time period. And you can see the, the, the price of either uh, used beverage cans, scrap, or old rolled scrap from construction sites, um, it's 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 a lot less than that, and it usually sits around 50 to 56 percent of the LME price. Goodness knows how that gets fixed, but it does, because you can see the, the the scrap curves or the scrap lines price trends exactly follow the the LME trends. The JLR line is the line that um, Mark White said. He said that if we really wanted aluminium to become the material of choice for use in most uh, car builds that the that the price paid for aluminium automotive sheet had to be down below fourteen hundred dollars a ton, which is where the orange line on that on that graphic is. And you can see that there's actually no chance of doing that from if you're if you're buying prime aluminium to start with. It's going to be incredibly difficult to do it from from scrap aluminium, but at least you start off below the line. So it it, it should, which is why. And this 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 graphic in its early form goes back to about 2006, which is why I, I really started working hard on trying to use recycled aluminium to make automotive alloys and components rather than, than prime aluminium. So where can we get this end of life scrap from? This is this is a very old slide. If you probably blow it, a lot of dust will come off it, but it it shows the the picture of UK end of life scrap as seen by Henry Dickinson of Norton Aluminium in 2006. And it gives a rough idea of his idea of the tonnages available in each scrap category and the, and the rough composition. And very quickly, when you, look, when you look at this table from 2006, you can see that it really is either the old rolled aluminium, which, which is either old rolled or old extruded from, from from end of life buildings, either in its loose form or bailed form, for which he was suggesting this 600,000 tons. There may be quite a lot less than that around, really. Or the shredder alloy, which is the aluminium fraction that comes from end of life vehicles after they've been shredded and gone through a, a, a magnetic separation. So it's uh, and, and possibly um, sink float separation to, to, get the, to get the aluminium fraction out. Which they're the they're the uh, they're the scrap streams that are most promising to to look for in terms of of where you might find material that you can, you can put back into alloys for automotive use. So we managed to run a series of of projects with Jaguar Land Rover based on this whole idea of of using more and more scrap. The first one was real car. You can see the range of partners and underneath uh, JLR brought in Novellis as their tame automotive sheet supplier in a were in because they sort of were out Al Alcan history uh, Norton for the information on scrap and scrap melting Brunel for some technology Stadco for stamping etc and that 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 really looked at the whole possibility of what we really what we could do with press shop scrap and what we did, we, look, we looked at how contaminated the press shop scrap could be with iron, and we could still make 5754 sheet that would roll. You can see that one's got some nice edge cracking. That's one we actually actually put too much iron in, in the trial coil. And you can see we've got, we've got cracking of the edges, which isn't very nice. Uh, if we put any more in, we actually got cracking of the ingots as, as well. The, um, 
once we realised we could make 5754, which would be perfectly acceptable to build cars with uh, uh, from uh, press shop scrap, the, uh, the the whole idea was how could we actually change the way the press shops ran such that that fraction of 5000 series alloys could be retained back to Novellis for remelting into 5754. And that turned out to be a much longer and more difficult task than we thought. And then obviously there, there was a the requirement that uh, Novellis then took back this scrap and paid uh, Jaguar Land Rover uh, an inverted commas fair price for it rather than as was happening that uh, the, the scrap from press shops was essentially just going into the scrap supply at a quite a low price. So that, that changed the dynamics of the of, 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 of building cars out of aluminium for Jaguar Land Rover. This, this just shows that eventually that, that its, its first use in Ango was, was on the Jaguar XE, as I've, as I've said before. And we get this general view that this is how we should be handling the whole business of, of building cars, looking after our scrap at every stage and feeding the, the alloy manufacturer as best we can with, with old scrap and prompt scrap rather than ever thinking of, of putting prime aluminium into the mix. To skip over that, that, that just really shows that even for Jaguar Land Rover to measure its press shop scrap was quite a considerable investment in all its stamping plants and its third party stamping plants, but it did all eventually come together and make a lot of sense. Uh, in Real Card 2, we looked at uh, much the same group of uh, partners but we looked at whether we could um, look at other forms of scrap, like um, scrap from domestic waste, scrap from um, mechanical biological treatments, plants, etc. Could we use that to actually feed into into the system? And that was it was it got we got to learn a lot more about scrap, but also we got to learn about how difficult it is to actually separate some of these scraps into into useful fractions to get them in a form where you can actually put them back into the, into the 5754. So I think real car two overall was slightly less successful than real car one, but it didn't um, it didn't it didn't uh, dim dim our enthusiasm too much, and we managed to run real car three, which uh, I would have loved to have called real car three, but everyone else decided we couldn't have real car three, so it became reality, which was recycling of aluminium through innovative technology, which was a, a nicer uh, project description for innovate to fund. And that's, that's again, similar series of partners, but this time we were really switching our attention to 6,000 series alloys, and switching our attention to end of life scrap rather than prompt scrap. And so we 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 looked at uh, end of life vehicle scrap and we the project was really set up to investigate the advanced separation technologies so that we could actually obtain a high enough quality feed to feed into the alloy production process. Of course, it's not totally straightforward. And in order to get something that will work in car manufacturing, you have to satisfy all the mechanical performance. You have to usually be within a chemical composition range, which is usually too um, formally applied. Uh, you have to satisfy the formula requirements. You have to have all the joining and self pierce riveting requirements satisfied. You can't have something that will corrode. It's got to be uniform in properties, unlike some composites. It has to su su satisfy the crash and fatigue requirements, etc. And it, it has to do all these wonderful things. So it's quite it's quite quite a big requirement, but that's that's no different for aluminium as it is is for steel. The uh, and we we looked at. The use of construction scrap, dipping into what we thought was the 300,000 tonnes of availability each year in the UK. We looked at uh, using scrap from shredded cars, although that's not usually just shredded cars, it's usually got some white goods mixed in it, in with it. And we also took the opportunity to, to shred some end of life uh, Jaguar eye paces just to see what we got, but we didn't there was virtually no useful separation done on that material, so nothing really useful happened to it. 
And there's always this promise that uh, that making the alloys out of scrap will be cheaper than lower cost than the than the primary aluminium. Certainly lower carbon, but the debate is still on as to whether it'll all be lower cost once you've once you've bought the material and you've added all the separation steps with all the losses etc that you get. But in principle, it should be a lower cost source of aluminium for making these uh, these vehicles. So we got a feel for how the actual con concentrations of the elements in the in the scrap would vary within certain ranges. Um, we uh, we all, it's always quite difficult when you're when you're using end of life vehicle scrap because it's got it's got a mixture of sheet alloys, casting alloys, extrusion alloys, forging alloys, and little bits and pieces of almost everything in. And what we really realised is that the the ability to sense and sort and get the fractions that we wanted from the end of life shredded car scrap was really wasn't quite where it needs to be yet. But this just just very quickly runs through what what the reality project covered right the way from the end of life sources, looking at the different companies are offering sensing and sorting technology. That one shows Palenque, but it could have been Tomra, Steinert, Red Wave, a, a number of companies that we looked at. We were always trying to pull out the wrought fraction from the cast fraction. Once we've got our wrought fraction, turn it into ingot, and then ingot into um, large DC cast rolling blocks, which went through rolling and then blanking through Novellis. A lot of testing, a lot of that which was done at WMG, SPR assessment, combination of WMG and Jaguar Land Rover, and then stamping trials. The end of the reality project, I think we just realised what we knew going in, that the cons consistency of the feed quality is, is key and, and, and it's difficult to really get a good handle on. But it was very clear that old rolled scrap of the, of the scrap fees that we looked at was much easier to handle with much less uh, requirement on sensing and sorting than, uh, than, than shredded vehicle scrap. And that's really what that says, because end of life vehicle scrap is, is known as Zorba, or when it's, uh, when it's actually uh, been through some further sorting of, of wrought, wrought and cast, when it's the wrought fraction, it's known as Twitch, but still not quite good enough. So we're really now looking around for where where the next breakthrough is going to be in in, in a sorting technology, and it looks like LIBS or laser induced breakdown spectroscopy is going to be is the new uh, great hope uh, because it's not like this, the technologies that are generally around at the moment, even the X-ray technology, which uh, just measure just looks at density. The uh, this technique actually is doing measurements on each on each on, it's doing chemical analysis on each piece of scrap. So in principle, it has the possibility of, of, of sorting not only wrought from cast, it can, it can also sort 5,000 from 6,000. And in its most recent guises can even sort between uh, within a single alloy grade to, to pull out the, the you know, high iron in, in, a, in, a, in a single grade. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. The problem is it's not so much that it's expensive, it's just not been shown to be robust enough uh, with a high enough throughput yet to be to, 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 to go into commercial operation. So it's, it's being trialled extensively, but it's not really at the commercial stage yet. I'm always pushing the envelope because I think in the main part of the um, Reality project. I think we managed to get some 6111 made with up to 20% end of life scrap incorporated, 20% prime and 60% press shop scrap, something like that, which to me wasn't really uh, that was bound to work because it ended up with a composition which was pretty well indistinguishable from the material it was meant to be tested against. So it, it ended up testing the same. But I was very keen that we did more than just looked at 20% uh, end of life scrap. So at Brunello was able to run some work which showed that we could we could actually make uh, HSA6, which is the extrusion equivalent of 6111, out of 100% post consumer scrap. In this case, um, scrap derived from old rolled aluminium and you can see we we were able to cast some nice uh, extrusion billets we were able to put them through the extrusion press to make a uh, uh, flat bar and then we were able to roll that down to make sheet and and it was just to 
indicative figures that just really shows just as long as you that that half a ton per ton is really it's just the is the is the gas required to, to melt a ton of, of aluminium and that flat bar we had really good properties uh, it pretty well performed as well as regular 6111 as supplied from Novellis in most forming operations etc the in a further project called Raceform, which is a which was an ABC project, we were able to, to do to run that procedure again at Brunel, but this time we I've been talking to a company called Scan Metals who were actually separating the aluminium fraction out from incinerator bottom ash in Wolverhampton using a lot of sensing and sorting technology, mainly based on infrared and X-ray sorting, so density sorting. And uh, and they have something called the Lion Queen grade, which is, is roughly seen there, which has got uh, a composition which actually blends very, very well into 6111. So to make 6111 from 100 percent incinerator bottom ash, all we really had to do was increase the copper and the magnesium levels a little bit. And I think I probably put in a little bit more titanium, manganese and chromium to make sure we didn't have any coarse outer band. But that um, that recycled Aluminium after it had been uh, been remelted by Norton Aluminium again, and then cast into DC extrusion logs and extruded into the same flat bar. Uh, that 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 performed remarkably well in hot forming and cold forming compared to uh, a regular uh, 6111 sheet as supplied by Novellis. But that, that's I think so. A couple of times we've now demonstrated that it is possible on at this scale to make the 6111 alloy or the HSA6 extrusion equivalent alloy out of 100% end of life scrap. So that's where we are today. None of that's going on commercially yet. So we're coming to the end. Um, just to summarize what I've tried to say, the aluminium industry, like the steel industry, is facing some really serious challenges and challenging and expensive sustainability challenges. Uh, on the aluminium side, I think aluminium in cars and aluminium in lots of other things has a, has a major, major role to play in future low carbon vehicle or other product production worldwide. The, the changes are being driven by legislation rather than want to do it, but that's a good thing. But absolutely critical for us to improve our ability to sense and sort end of life aluminiums scrap and it's going to be a combination of prompt, both prompt scrap and end of life scrap. I don't really worry about prompt scrap that much because if you get end of life scrap right eventually the prompt scrap becomes the same as in terms of carbon intensity as the end of life scrap apart from a little bit of extra processing you have to do to bring it around again and I think everything we do should be as, as best we can to using as much end of life recycled aluminium as we can. So I think that's it. So hopefully I haven't kept you all too long, but uh, thank you all for listening and I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Is that any questions? Oh, Lord. Can I, yeah, can I ask? Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, yeah. Jeff. It was a lovely, um, a lovely summary of where things are and, and the history of where we've got to. And I think, you know, that coming down to the sorting is, is absolutely right. I think we recognise it from the steel industry side. Yeah. I think that sorting is is critical. Perhaps I can ask a, a sort of related question that you talk about the fact that at the moment the lib sorting is not quite yet robust enough, and whatever happens, it's going to increase cost for for the scrap. Where do you sit with um, opportunities for dismantle as opposed to shred and sort? I know you still got to have sorting. But we may also have tracking information. Do you ever see that as being viable um, as part of the mix, not necessarily exclusive? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you. I, I would love to see OEMs running manufacturing lines and dismantling lines of, of, of pretty well of the same vehicles, and I, I, I really think that is that's a much, much better way of doing it than what we do now. 
it's 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 uh, and I you know I think that should become in the future that should be really far more of the way OEMs operate. In fact, you know that that they that they assemble vehicles, they then lease the vehicles to you, and then they take them back and they re refurbish them or you know, re re engine them, rebattery them, and 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 maybe that goes two or three times around the loop, and then at the end they might they would then be responsible for dismantling the Hulk. You know, I, I think I think that is definitely the way to go. But at the moment, uh, the, the way the world works is that end of life vehicles are shredded very efficiently. In in you know, a, a car hog is goes through a shredder in 15 seconds. So, so it's it, it's really hard to beat at the moment. But I think you know, I, I agree entirely with you that it's the wrong. It's basically the wrong approach, and we but we have to live with it for a while. I think. I think you're absolutely right. I think there's some interesting things that hopefully we'll, we'll start to explore about yeah. what the business model is to shift to some of these alternate uh, modes of, of working, if you like. So what can be done just by improving the technology to make it more efficient and where you need policy shifts to, to make it economically viable, at least, mm -hmm. to, to explore. But yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, good, thank you. Joseph, please. Hi, Jeff. Um, so my question is, is um, you have done like three projects, real car two, one, two, and reality. So trying to explore different options for the recycling. Yep. So now it looks like this is the one with one project you are look you have looked at it's a um, closed loop recycling. And then the recent project or the next two projects you look at like uh, using whatever scrap you can uh, con consume to uh, even scraps, sort of a mixed scrap, and then to get a better sorting, and then to use it for the high quality, you want to upgrade high quality aluminum. So these two routes, one is a closed loop, one is like using whatever scrap you can get, if we say we want to do a better job in aluminum recycling, which route would be better? Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of closed loop. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's yes, I, I, I would, I would love, uh, you know, I'd love to sort out the world of can making. I, I, I really would like uh, at the moment, if you look at. Uh, well, wherever I look, whichever market, whatever part of the world I look, it appears that about half the cans come back in real, whatever you might read, when you actually d dive down into the figures, it looks like about half the cans come back and go on to make new can stock, which is, okay. uh, some countries actually collect more, but they, they don't actually end up going back into can stock. And it looks like the world seems to set itself up to use half uh, recycled cans and half prime to make the next generation of cans. And, and the even more crazy thing is that, that, that half of the can stock is, has a very, very high recycled content, uh, approaching 90%, and the other half is made entirely from prime. And it, it, it's just wrong. Uh, and so I, yeah, I'm, I, I would really love to disrupt that. <laughs> and so I, I, at the moment, in fact, that's more where I'm spending, I'm spending more of my time in that area rather than in cars at the moment. But, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I really think, and, and it, 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 I think the, the the United States have thrown away, I think, 1.7 trillion aluminium cans to date, which is absolutely appalling. But anyway, that's so. Yes, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I really like I like I like aluminium siloed in uses and and being looked at looked after in those uses in a closed loop as far as possible. So, so that means your idea is actually the from uh, from cans to cans, from cars to cars. Not Absolutely. From, no, no, not the, from no. no, no to people, cars. yeah, people, yeah. It, it was a very bad choice of title, really, because exactly. it's so. Uh, uh, well, but, 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 but I, you know, I, I do, I, you know, I love ambiguity, so it's uh, it's. Uh, so it appeals to my weird sense of humour, but but um, 
no, it, 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 the title Cans to Cars was was really to show that I, I quite like the way the rec that, that cans are recycled back into cans, although not enough. And, and it was really to say we take that model for cans and we use that model for cars, so cars to cars. So it should, it should say from cans to cans to cars to cars. That's really, okay. but that's that's a bit cumbersome. <laughs> that's that's a bit cumbersome. <laughs> so another question is, is okay. I'll ask another yes. question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so your talk is about recycling of aluminium. So actually, if you look at the whole aluminium industry, is uh, another half is about prime aluminium. So how we're going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from the primary side? Well, I think yes, it's it's, it's got to be it's got to be only to use um, clean electricity. Okay. That, but but the but it's also very very difficult to 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 solve the electrolysis problem because uh, essentially running a cell, but uh, where where, the, where you're essentially re reducing alumina uh, with carbon is, is a very efficient process. And if, if you take the carbon out, because the byproduct then becomes carbon dioxide, which is the problem, uh, it, the, 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 uh, the actual, the, 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 the carbon actually de depolarizes the cell. So if, if you actually go to inert anodes, you actually lose cell voltage. So you have to put more, actually to get the same amount of aluminium out, you have to up the current used. So, so you have to actually put you actually put more more electricity in. So there's, I mean, it's it's good to see all this stuff on low carbon primary, uh, but it's 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 just it's it's been around for a really long time. Obviously, it's time might be now, but and and there's a lot of questions as always as to what what is the carbon intensity of the inert anode production technology, and that and that that you, you'll never see any answers on that at the moment. I mean, it's it's a it's a good thing, and certainly Apple are getting lots of good publicity out of it. But how real it is, I don't know. I th I actually think carbon capture and storage is going to be is going to have a big bigger effect on on that, and I think we might end up still reducing uh, aluminium with with carbon rather than in our anodes. But we'll see. So, so but, but, it, but, but if you solve the if you solve the electrolysis problem, you've still got lots of issues. On, with primary aluminium, with all the you know, with all the the bauxite to uh, alumina transition, all the all the all the red mud problems, or and and you know, it, there's there's an there's an awful lot which almost doesn't get talked about while the focus is on the uh, on the on the smelting technology itself. So, which is why I you know I prefer to duck out of all that because I know how difficult it is, and say well let's let's sub let's subvent the problem by uh, by closed loop re recycling of end of life aluminium and 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 really only use primary to top up where those loops fail or, or where the where the where the loop is expanding okay thank you thank you uh, professor Honda, you still have a question hello is yeah hi oh hi Right. Hi, hi, Jeff. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, first of all, I was supposed to say probably in the recent you have played a very uh, big role in promoting aluminium RD or in collaboration with industrial partners. And then uh, we have steel research as well. And then uh, what's your probably your 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 view about you know, the the competition between the steel and aluminium? I think it's, <laughs> right. I, I think it's great. I wouldn't have it any other way. I think it's I otherwise I, it's a little known fact that I did my PhD on steel. So <laughs> so, so you know I I'm, I I I, 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 I was very happy to switch to aluminium because it's it, it was lots of interesting things to do. But but no I I, I think it, I I really look I I really like what the steel industry is doing in terms of improving the properties of steels. I I, I think that work is absolutely tremendous. And, and the, way, the way I see it, that should be a huge incentive to the aluminium industry 
to actually understand the metallurgical developments that the steel industry is going through. Of course, we haven't got the same phase transformations, but we've got lots of interesting things going on. And, 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 and the work I really like is, is, is trying to understand the you know, what, what makes a really good, strong microstructure for, in, in a steel and seeing, you know, can we generate those kind of microstructures in aluminium alloys? And, and we've been making qu quite good progress, not as fast as I would like, mm -hmm. but, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've taken some fairly modest 6,000 series alloys and essentially you know, doubled their doubled their yield strength. But at the moment, we haven't got a route to do it, which is which is commercially viable. But the fact you can actually demonstrate it, I think, is really good. So yeah, so th th that's so. Th but you know, I, I and I, I like it, and I like you know at the moment we're we're, we're really interested in aluminium in battery enclosures. But it, again, you can see that the steel industry is not is not standing still. You know, mm. it's, it's offering some really good, you know, Martin City grades, really strong. But and 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 saying, well, you you know, we can actually, we might even with steel, might be able to get down to the same sort of weight save that you can mm. do with aluminium. So I, I I just think it's great, and I think mm. it's, it's it's how it should be. Mm. It's probably we have probably more more kind of balanced view or, or application wise. You know, for steel, you can have life structure as well to, to address this. Uh, uh, efficiency issue, right? Yes. Mm. I, I think this is where the, the two industries push each other, which case yeah. you get the best out of both industries. I think that's, yeah, exactly it. It. Mm. It, it. Then it's about, I, you know, part of the reason we're talking about this idea of the disassembly is the fact that you can use then the best material in each individual component part without having to worry so much about all the cross contamination because if yes. you can disassemble, you can really then we need to push better joining technologies between the really high strength aluminium and steels and you know it, it pushes you into different different challenges to overcome yes no yeah no, i know i i i i it is it, it which is why we've got we've actually got some quite nice collaborative programs starting haven't we now which is which which is really good because i think we can learn so much from each other Thank you. Right. Okay. Jeff, one question related to the rivet, because in aluminium it is very difficult to weld. That's why you use the rivet, and that's made of steel, and the, that's add the weight plus cost, and then the later on it's create the problem in the recycling. Is it you see the any future in the they like, get rid of completely rivet and the weld? Um, well. The trouble is the rivet. The rivet is, is it, 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 it turns out to be such a really good joining procedure, particularly for sort of multi multi stack ups. It's yeah. really it's it, and and it isn't really. I mean, we all thought it'd be a terrible problem in mm. recycling. Uh, mm. it, it turns out not to be. I mean, if you if 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 you're if you're up at North in aluminium. Mm -hmm. And you you see a melt go through, you know, a, a lot of uh, shredded cars with lots of aluminium sections joined together with rivets going into the furnace. You think that's going to be awful. The iron level will be really bad, but it isn't because <laughs> if you look at the bottom of the furnace where everything's dropped out, you just see all all these glistening rivets, which are, are nicely aluminized steel rivets, which have which have been because the aluminium's melted away from them. And and but it, it's reacted with the steel to form a really nice aluminized layer on the steel, and 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 that's in, to a large extent that's prevented the the iron actually dissolving in the aluminium. So you really don't see it as it's not the problem we all thought it was, which is lucky because I think getting rivets out of car construction is going to be difficult because on the on the shop floor uh, the the uh, it's just a nicer environment if you're not spot welding. If you're riveting, it's you know it's 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 not even particularly noisy. Okay. Yeah. So I think yes, but I, I think difficult to get out, but actually not the problem we all thought it was. And I've still I've yet to see a corrosion failure around a, a steel rivet in an aluminium car, except when we've artificially done it by not protecting the steel. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, any more questions? From the... okay, let me see if it's okay. No, it's just to say thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. That was a, a very 
a very enjoyable talk to listen to. And I think, you know, one particularly for those within the group who are looking at steels, it's just that reminder to think about the ways in which we recycle, the way we need to plan going forward. I think, in, and it, you know, there are so many parallels between the two. It's nice to see it from a different perspective than the one we would come at it naturally. So thank you very much. Great stuff. Yeah, well, thank you. Th Thanks, Hiran. Thanks for uh, thank thanks you, for you. Thanks for you for listening, and thanks for Hiran for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye bye. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.